the scripture that I chose to reflect on tonight, it um, comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, very early in our Lord's ministry, when he's just getting known because of his preaching and his teaching, his early followers of his disciples. So it's very early in his ministry. But his name and his uh, reputation is growing. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, let's reflect on this from the fourth chapter of St. Luke and see how the Lord may be speaking to us at this early part of Lent and where the Lord might be calling each one of us. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had, who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went to a lonely place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So this early image of Jesus healing and um, interacting with people in their need, it created an incredible, an incredible kind of um, message in the community. Everybody was looking for Jesus. And people were looking for Jesus for all kinds of reasons. But they were probably coming to look for Jesus for reasons that were less than the reason to honor him, to worship him, to commit their life to him, to follow him. They were looking for something for themselves. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, many of us, that's where we start, is that we need something, and so we go to the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it can't end by just our own need. It, it, it's the beginning. You see, because the Lord's ministry then and now is not to simply be a kind of Santa Claus who gives us what we want or to give us things because we have, um, you know, because we've earned them. Sometimes people think we can earn God's grace if we just do enough, if we're just good enough. But no, he's, he's, he's doing something categorically different. He's wanting to draw us into a relationship with him. And the longer that I travel in my own journey of being, trying to be a disciple and, and being a priest, I see that there's always a new challenge. We never kind of arrive. I think maybe there was a time in my life when I thought it was gonna get easier. I kind of suspected that other people had figured out something that I hadn't figured out yet as a seminarian, as a young priest. And I thought, well, I'm going to get to that place where I'm going to have my major problems worked out. It's not going to be so hard anymore. But in every season of life, there's always a new opportunity to go deeper. And so whether you are in elementary school, and just hearing about the Lord for the first time, if you're in high school, if you're in college, if you're newly married, if you're raising your family, if you are widowed or widower, or if you're in the retirement stage of your life, wherever you are tonight, this is the invitation to discipleship and to new life. This is it. There's no more exotic moment. I wish I could say that there's going to be, but there's not. 
And, and, and sometimes, you know, when we're waiting for a particular moment, we can kind of save our zeal for something that never comes. You see, it's oftentimes when we give ourselves over to the struggles of the moment and seek to be faithful in these circumstances, that's the pleasing gift that the Lord wants to give to us. And that's what we can give to him, the most important thing we can give to him. And you know that the mysterious thing about um, the Lord's, um, as he began to become known, and he began to call his disciples, is that they were having to ask some very fundamental questions about who he is. You know, they, they were aware there was a Messiah coming. And one of the things that they knew from their tradition is that this, the Messiah would be able to do things, supernatural things. He would be able to, as Isaiah tells us in the seventh chapter of Isaiah, he's going to heal, he's going to bind up wounds, he's going to, he's going to heal the blind, he's going to heal the lame, he's going to heal the leper. All of those things that Isaiah prophesied, they knew that that was part of the Messiah's mission. But when it began to happen, they, many people lost sight of that. And it was also true that many people were in a position of, of then, well, but he doesn't look like what we were expecting. He doesn't sound like what we were expecting. And so they began to have to question about who he is. How can he be really the Messiah? How can he be the Son of Man? How can he be the Son of God? And I say all of this because we are in a very precarious moment in the life of the church in America. You know, we're in a time which is called Eucharistic Revival, and I think that the people that Father Thomas has asked to come to speak, that there might be a theme related to the Holy Eucharist. And so thanks be to God, we have our Lord present tonight with us in the Holy Eucharist to revive us in our faith about the Eucharist. But it occurs to me, and I think it will occur to you, that we can't really have a revival of Jesus in the Eucharist unless we first of all have a revival about, well, who is Jesus in the first place? Why did he come? What was the purpose of his mission? Is it still valid? Does Jesus still answer the deepest questions of the human heart? Have we intentionally heard his message and surrendered to it? Therefore, have we encountered him and said yes to him with all of my life? Well, that's a very important question for each of us to ask during the season of Lent. Who is Jesus? And of course, we can give good catechetical and theological reasons, hopefully, Maybe sometimes not. But more to the point, we have to be able to answer the question interiorly in our own heart. Do I believe that he's Lord? Do I believe that he's God? Can I trust him with my life? Can I trust him with my most vulnerable and difficult part of who I am? And do I even trust him with my failing health? Do I trust him with my diagnosis of cancer? Do I trust him with my financial hardship? Do I trust him with my son addicted to drugs? Do I trust him with my marriage that's falling apart? You see, the Lord Jesus is not a removed title to be used only in polite religious settings. But the surrender to the person of Jesus Christ like these people began to do in the scripture is our Lenten work. It's really the most serious work that any of us have to do. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, have mercy on my brokenness. Lord, I believe, help me to get to the next place. It's too hard. You see, when we begin to 
really claim him as Lord, when we really drop our nets and we're sold out for God, that's when the Eucharist begins to make sense. It's when we are aware of our vulnerability, we're aware of our need, we're aware, we're aware that we can't do it without him. It's like, you know, setting out on a journey and trying to have enough protein and enough snack bars and enough water in my backpack to make it. You know, everything for that journey is gonna be so precious and so needed for my energy. And if we really understand that Jesus is Lord, if we really understand that he sees us and he knows us and he's calling us and we can trust him with our life, then no matter how hard it gets, we know that he's gonna give us the strength to keep going. It may not taste good, we might think we need more, but it will be enough. That's the promise of the Holy Eucharist. But the promise of the Eucharist is always connected to our faith, to our belief. And you see, in order to be able to say yes to who Jesus is, it's gonna require that probably most of us are gonna to have to say a lot of no's. It's fascinating, isn't it, that in the gospel, it's almost a scandal in this particular gospel passage. There was, a whole, there was a whole bunch of needs. And the disciples said, Lord, all these people, they're looking for you. They, 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 they need you. And Jesus says, I got to go on to the next town. Now, that's kind of scandalous, isn't it? How would you feel if you were one of those people in need and you were waiting to see Jesus and you were told, well, he said he's going to leave to go to the next town? Sounds bad. But what is the Lord teaching us? He's teaching us that to be faithful to our mission, well, first of all, we have to know what our mission is. So we have to be people of prayer and reflection and honest discernment in our life. We have to know our mission. But then we have to be willing to disappoint people and trust that the Lord is going to be able to meet the need in another way. That's hard to do. I know myself because I like to please people. I want people to think well of me. I want people to think I'm a good guy. I, don't want to say, I didn't want to say no to Father Thomas to come and speak to all of you nice people tonight, so I said yes, you know? So we, we like people to think well of us. But sometimes we have to say no to all kinds of things, and people will be disappointed. But if we really know our mission, if we really are in communion with Jesus, then we're about the kingdom of God. We may not win friends, we may be misunderstood. We may find ourselves on the outs of certain crowds of people. But then we can have the peace that the world does not know. Namely, we can have the friendship of Jesus. We can know that he understands and knows why we are making the determination that we're making. We are then able to prioritize and to put into place that kind of I know that this is the right thing, Lord, because you're calling me to do it. It's not going to be popular, but you did it. You see, you and I do nothing other than reproduce Jesus' own life within us. That's what he does. He reproduces his life in us as we, as we, we allow him more deeply into us. As we consume the Holy Eucharist, did you know that the Eucharist is meant to change us into him? St. Augustine spoke about that. You know, when you eat food, it, it, uh, it, turns into, uh, it turns into us. But when we eat the Holy Eucharist, we, it transforms us into him. It's a, it's a reversal of that. And so that, in a certain sense, we take on different characteristics and different qualities because we consume him over and over and over and over. And the transformation sometimes is dramatic, but most of the time it's subtle. And you know, one of the things that um, I love about being a priest happens when almost nobody else is there. And that is being with someone when they're close to death. And if they're still conscious and they can speak 
and I know that Father Thomas has been there too, and you can bring people the sacraments. And to see a person who believes getting ready to die is a beautiful moment. It really is, because in that moment, everything is falling apart. You know, in, in, those, in those kind of conversations, people don't say such things as, you know, I wish I would have spent more time at the office. I wish I had a second house at the shore. I wish I, they don't, they don't lament those kinds of things when people are dying. When people are dying, they're very, very close to the most essential things of life. And even people who were, they say, well, you know, Father, I wasn't really a very good Catholic throughout my life. I did okay, but I, I, I you know, I did this and that. I said, well, let's go to confession. People go to confession. But when you ask them if they want Holy Communion, normally speaking, everybody at that moment says, yes, I want Holy Communion. I want Jesus. Give me Jesus. It's, it's, the, it's the faith of the church. It's where we all got to get to in a certain sense. It's to that kind of desiring Jesus when we're so vulnerable and we're so broken that we have nothing left but him. That's when he reigns. That's when he's reigning in glory. And it's oftentimes in a hospital room or a nursing home or in a hospice, in the you know they turn the turn the the living uh, the dining room into a, a, a place for the person to die in the house. You know it's it's not glorious at all by the standards of the world, but he's present, and to be able to be a priest to proclaim Jesus in that moment, to give people that last taste of the bread of life to see all of life come to a conclusion. There's nothing, there's nothing more powerful. There's nothing more powerful than to see that moment. And you see, that's why we're here tonight, is because we want Jesus. You wouldn't have come here. Well, you heard I was a fantastic speaker, so you wanted to come for that, right? But, 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 you, but you, you, see, you see, deep down, you want something more. You came out on a Friday night in Lent to do something different, because you look around at your life and you say, I want something more. We all do. But we get distracted and we don't always know what the more is, right? Well, maybe if I go on a vacation. Well, maybe I need to go to lunch. Maybe I need a glass of wine. Maybe I... We can come up with all kinds of things that the more is, but deep down inside of us, the more is we want him. We want Jesus. Just like those people in the gospel that were looking for him for all their needs, they came for different reasons, but deep down, they wanted him. You see, as we continue on this Lenten journey and as we, um, you know, we enter into more of what the church is calling us to in our times with Eucharistic revival, Eucharistic revival is, you know, can be a good website and webinars and things that diocesan staff look at and priests have to try to do things in their bulletins. But Eucharistic revival is you and me saying yes to Jesus. That's what it is. It's not very exotic at all. It's kind of boring, really. But on the other hand, it's the most exciting, the most worth worthwhile adventure that we'll ever go on if we surrender truly to his word if we, can, if we really do make him Lord of our life. And if we've given up, if we've grown lackluster, if we, you know, we're mediocre, well, well, welcome. That's what Lent is all about, to shake us up out of our, out of our complacency. We all do it together. We're coming to the Lord together, and there's something beautiful about that. We can lean into that and trust that we all need conversion. We all need a revival of faith. We all need Jesus. So tonight, you have chosen the better part. You've wanted more, and so you've come to him, and he wants to give you more. I don't know what that is, but I know he wants to give you something tonight. Take a couple of moments of, of quiet and converse with him. Speak to him. Trust that he's really here. And, and, and ask him for what you need and praise him because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and Prince of Peace.
and he's here. He's here for you, and he's here for me. And Blessed be God that we need him. So spend some quiet time in humility speaking with the Lord.